The duality of Eddie George's childhood is unique. He's got that kind of cold motivation from his father being an addict, meaning in this case, he was rarely present in Eddie's life when he was a young child. But mix that with the insistence from Eddie's mom that her son become cultured and well-rounded. And it gave him a lot of that dog you get from coming up hard, along with a mindfulness that you don't always find in a warrior. While his dad was away lodged in the grips of addiction, Eddie's mom pulled her son in a much different direction. She forced the man to participate in dance classes and theater. And like a lot of young boys would, Eddie hated every second of it. But as he got older, he would start to view those childhood performances kind of like an early apprenticeship, you know? He got so comfortable performing in front of a crowd that down the line he struggled with depression once the cheers went away. But that was down the line. As a kid, he relished that time when he was all alone and nobody was watching. It allowed him to dream about what he truly wanted. And he didn't know it at the time, but he manifested it. So he would stuff the large dry off towels into the collar of his shirt, pretend they were shoulder pads and let us imagine go. And by the time he was 11, his imagination was so powerful that the kids started practicing his Heisman Trophy speech in the mirror. He quickly became one of those kids who had their own thing going on on the side of the bleachers at the high school football game. Then a few years later, he would move to the actual field. And now everybody who showed up at the game was actually coming to see him. Armed with real shoulder pads as opposed to a bath towel, he would start to live out those things he used to only imagine. So in football, you're taught to keep a good base, keep your feet underneath you to generate power. But in his real life, the budding star had lost that balance. He was getting way ahead of himself and starting to stumble in school. So once Eddie hit the 10th grade, his mom sent his ass to military school. She'd had enough of her kid walking out of classes and disrespecting teachers. She had to get him back in check. Eddie was upset, but he brought it on himself. And with his dad mostly out of the picture, his mom knew this 6'2 kid who was growing super fast was at a point in his life where he was gonna need some male discipline. During the seven hour drive up to military school, Eddie looked out the window and didn't speak once. He just stared into the distance, feeling sorry for himself, thinking his mom didn't get it and that she was ruining his dream. What he didn't realize was that Fort Union Military Academy was well known for their high school sports. At that time, Eddie had a dream, but he didn't have a vision. But that's okay, because in the meantime, his mom was his eyes. The experience at Fort Union had the opposite effect of what a young Eddie thought that it would. It didn't destroy his dream, it got him closer to it. It gave him the tools he needed to build the life he wanted. Being in that environment taught him discipline, taught him work ethic, taught him respect the three major pillars on which he built his entire college and nfl career eddie stayed at fort union for three total years 11th grade 12th grade and a postgraduate year during that time he grew from six feet 170 to 6'2", 220 which sounds kind of crazy that's 50 pounds in just three years but I'm assuming the weight program was a whole lot different. Plus, according to Eddie, he was now around guys who really showed him how to work in that weight room. Also, he spent what would have been his freshman year in college as a postgraduate year. So I guess it's feasible. I guess for him, he put on that freshman 15 as basically a fifth year senior in high school. His mom sent him there to go from boy to man mentally, which he did. But he also went from boy to man physically. His final year at Fork Valley, dude averaged a prodigious, a monstrous, bro. This is a ridiculous stat. 275 rushing yards on the damn ground per individual game in which he stepped on the field. That's an entire offense worth of production. Despite this, most of the colleges who recruited Eddie George recruited him not to keep running the damn rock. They recruited him to play linebacker. And while I see the vision, it's like, bro, you overlooking what's right in front of you. Because he was tall, you could say his running style is upright, but his momentum going forward was nothing to play with. They had seen Eric Dickerson already at this point, and they hadn't seen Derrick Henry yet, but he was coming too. With Eddie George, I couldn't find a reliable 40-yard dash time, but by no means was the man a speed in. I saw one thing that said he ran a 4-6, which based on seeing him play, that feels kind of accurate. But during his time at Fork Valley State, he won two state titles running hurdle races and track. Though I'm not exactly sure what the specific events were, 
maybe the 300 hurdles maybe the 100 i don't know ohio state was one of the few d1 schools that recruited eddie george to stay at running back the only problem was he wasn't the only one that promised that and he was a freshman sitting behind four future draft picks four nfl players bro sitting in front of you at a position where there's usually just one on the field we all know that running backs love to get downhill but how will you respond to an uphill battle the NCAA tournament is starting to heat up with bigger stakes, bigger plays, and even bigger wins. So fill out your brackets with who you think will rise to the top and place your bets with my partners at DraftKings Sportsbook. And right now, new customers who bet $5 get $150 in bonus bets instantly. So download the DraftKings app now and sign up using my code FLIMLO. The crown is yours. Again, any new customer who bet $5 will instantly receive $150 in bonus bets. Now you can use that $150 in bonus bets on DraftKings same game parlays. That's an efficient way to do it. Combine multiple bets together from the same game for a chance to win even bigger prizes, you know? Now, if sports betting is not yet available in your state, don't worry, you can still join in on the fun. Just for you, they've got DraftKings Daily Fantasy, where you participate in contests for the opportunity to win some cash prizes. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. And new customers, don't forget to use my promo code FLIMLO, then bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets instantly. Now you got some bets that you can play with. That's promo code FLIMLO, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. As a freshman, he did play. He got 37 carries, mostly early in the season. And like Tupac's mom, he tried to make Thanksgiving dinner, but he was just working with the scraps he was given. He tied for second on the team with five scores as a freshman. They called him Touchdown Eddie. He was going to put the ball in the end zone. But while it often takes a long time to build a reputation, it only takes a couple moments to ruin that joint. Touchdown Eddie became known as not a dude who scored touchdowns, but a dude who instead gave them to the other team. Versus Illinois, who was a big Ohio State rival at the time, dude fumbled twice in the red zone. One of those fumbles was scooped and scored by the defense, and the other they fell on and took possession. This is where Eddie would have to lean on what he learned at Fork Valley. Without that formal education, bro, this would have broke him. Immediately after the crucial fumbles versus Illinois, Eddie felt his larger-than-life dreams was in the crosshairs of the Grim Reaper. His dreams was hanging on for life, but barely hanging on as both his confidence and standing within the team took a pretty big hit. It was to the point where his teammates was throwing shots at him all the time. Don't drop your lunch tray, big fella. Make sure you hang on to it. When your reputation within the team takes a hit like that, I don't think people understand how much that can affect your mental state. Now, there's no way to know for sure, but I'd like to imagine that his senior quarterback came to his aid. That's because it was a guy that every college fan rocks with in his only year starting your boy Kirk Herbstreit. As a matter of fact, somebody tell Kirk to get back in the booth and record this Eddie George fumble story for the game. In College Football 25, my freshman running back fumbles in a big game or a big moment, I want to hear this story. After the fumbles, Eddie was completely demoted. They took away all his practice reps, and you know they took his game reps. Seems harsh, but remember, Ohio State got four NFL backs. Four other NFL backs, right? Not including Eddie. So unfortunately for him, bro, they didn't have the time to cater to a freshman after he had kind of blown his opportunity. If it was today, he would have transferred. And even though I know the outcome and it worked out this time with him not transferring, I would have understood if he he got up out of there but he took the harder path and eventually he worked his way through his sophomore season dude continued to live in the doghouse getting only five more total carries than he got as a freshman but while he was living in that doghouse he made some renovations added a weight room a film room he found ways to get better this is where that mindfulness his mom put in him mixed in with that dog that his dad's situation put in him. eddie george internalized all the adversity then converted it into fuel bro to power his engine he sat back and broke down his game. He thought he was more agile when he was younger. So he did what he'd done as a kid. He took dance classes. He hated them as a kid, but now he could see the difference they made in his footwork and core strength. He took martial arts classes, did Kempo. Whatever edge he could find, he sought that out. By the time he stepped out the doghouse, he was a whole different breed. His junior season rolled around. 
and he was ready to get to it. Finally, as a junior in 1994, Eddie had worked his way into the start and running back position. If you was impressed by what he did with the crumbs from his freshman season, wait till you see what Duke can do with a full fridge of groceries. With 276 rushing attempts, Eddie ran for 1,442 yards. He went from 42 attempts to 276, but maintained the exact same yards per carry average. But his junior year was just a warm up, because in 1995, all the extra classes, all the extra work, all the hours in the weight room, and that long ass journey to get out of the doghouse would all come together for a near perfect season. On his way to what at the time was the best Ohio State single season rushing performance ever. Eddie George had to face off against a familiar foe. It was the prison guard who locked the gates to his doghouse in the first place. As a freshman, dude had fumbled twice against Illinois, which halted what at that point was a promising freshman season. It took him years to shake back from what Illinois did to him, and now he had the chance to look them in their eyes once again. When he looked across, he saw two future first round linebackers. That was Simeon Rice and Kevin Hardy. They were so cold they went back to back in the 96 draft at picks 2 and 3. So the second overall pick and the third overall pick staring across at you on the same defense. Unsurprisingly, Illinois had the number one defense in college against the run. So if Eddie George was gonna get his revenge, I ain't gonna lie bro, he picked a hell of a time to try to do it. Despite that, he got his leg back that day, big time. Dude rushed for 314 yards, despite sitting most of the fourth quarter because it was a damn blowout. And one thing you'll see about Eddie during this story, he had to hold a couple L's, but he always came back. He never sat on the L and just rolled over and died. He would get back up to his feet, man. He always fought back. And after his redemption against Illinois, the whole crowd chanted his name. Touchdown, Eddie was back. After all of that, Dude was now ready to high step into his football destiny. That 1995 season put him in the history books, a neighborhood in which he still resides till this day. His 1,927 yard season would stand as the school record for the next 25 years. He ran 24 touchdowns and added a pass catching element to his game as well for an extra 400 plus yards. And man, after all of that, all he had to do was remember that speech he practiced when he was 11. He flashed back to the mirror and once again gave his speech, but this time he was holding the trophy for real. So he walks away with the trophy. Then shortly after that at the airport, the trophy gets caught in the conveyor belt. He had to pull the hell out of it to get it out of there. And this is right after he got it and it came out, but the finger snapped off. I guess no matter how big you get, no matter what goals you accomplish, nobody's invincible not the player or the trophy. The following year, he was drafted by the Houston Oilers in the 1996 NFL Draft. First round pick, 14th overall, 6'3", 250 pound back. Eddie George described his early career less like a running back and more like a heavyweight boxer. He said he'd wear opponents down with body shots galore. Then in the 12th round or fourth quarter, he'll knock your ass out. Unlike college, in the league, bro, he hit the ground running. 1,368 yards right out of the gate. Scores eight touchdowns, wins offensive rookie of the year. By the time he got to the NFL, he was developed. He was ready. He was one of those players who was immediately in his prime. And his first five years all looked like this. If you just said, damn, that's an appropriate response. With a report card like this, you probably get some new J's. Now, earlier in the video, I mentioned Eric Dickerson as another tall running back who ran kind of upright. I wanted to get you thinking about him because him and Eddie George share a little more in common than an upright running style. They're the only two players to rush for 1,200 yards or more every year for their first five years which is an interesting fact since that upright running style isn't generally seen as ideal now maybe you can argue that it affects longevity but that's tough for me because most running backs primes are pretty short there's a few Emmett Smiths and Frank Gores of the world but regardless of style there's not a lot of those dudes out here so Eddie George was the last starting running back for the Houston Oilers and the only star in running back for the Tennessee Oilers. But in 1999, the Oilers became the Tennessee Titans. And I swear, bro, this damn team, this team keeps a fire running back. Bro, they only been around for 25 years. And already they had Eddie George, Chris Johnson, and King Henry. We talking top or near top backs 
during their primes. The first year the Titans existed, they had prime Eddie George. Now the team had basically been stuck in the transition stage ever since Eddie George stepped in the league. But now we finally saw what it felt like to have a true home crowd. And you know how Eddie relished playing in front of the crowd, bro. And after being perpetually 500, 79s and 8 and 8s his whole career to that point, the 99 2000 NFL season would change all of that for your boy Eddie George. The Tennessee Titans went 13 and 3, and Eddie George made his first playoff appearance. In round one, the beastly back went for 106 yards. Then in round two, he ran that thing for 162. Third round, they didn't need him as much as the game got out of hand. And in the Super Bowl, you can't say that Eddie didn't show up. Now, if not for one of the the most improbable plays in league history you know the music city miracle they pulled off against the bills i was a kid bro watching this live and i had no clue how rare it was but for some reason it still felt like a miracle but if not for that play they wouldn't have got out of the first round but once they did they didn't stop till they got to the super bowl touchdown eddie had two scores in a big game but his team still fell just a couple inches short it was a chance to put the ultimate stamp onto his career and after that trip bro he never make it back he skipped the pro bowl and started training immediately like i said anytime he held the l bro he always fought back the team that loses oftentimes has the super bowl hangover but eddie wasn't having it he came back the next year on fire Eddie George had his best season as a pro. He made his fourth Pro Bowl, made first team all pro, 1,500 yards on the ground, 14 rushing touchdowns. He also had 50 catches for 453 receiving yards. So yeah, man, dude was getting it done. The team was still good and finished 13 and three again, but they would need another miracle to get out of the first round. In the wild card round, Eddie had to face a guy who would become his all time nemesis. It's a little bit surprising since Eddie's 1996 draft class featured these two beasts he faced off against in college but it wasn't the second or third pick that hunted the 14th selection it was a guy all the way down at pick 26. drafted into the same division both building teams up into contenders these two lions was destined to face off ray lewis has admitted to adding weight to his frame specifically to help him deal with Eddie George. Ray spoke about how he tried to intimidate his opponents by aggressively staring deep into their eyes. His philosophy was if a man's soul wasn't sturdy enough, if you stared deep enough into it, that man would blink. If the man blinked, that would let Ray know that he'd officially won the intimidation game. But according to Ray, Eddie George never blinked. He never shot away, so Ray viewed him as another lion. But Ray's analogy, which holds up pretty well, was that when two male lions who come from different prides cross paths and lock eyes, they had to go at it. And they did. They went at it, bro. Over and over. And for better or worse, this would define Eddie George's career. And it hurts Eddie because the first time Ray got the best of him. To the point where some said Eddie folded after being hit by Ray. Some said he didn't run with the same tenacity after that. Of course, Eddie heard the talk. And yeah, he was pissed. He ran hard in round two. And he was having his way. Imposing his will on the Ravens defense. But like I said, your whole reputation can be ruined in one moment. And it wasn't Eddie's run and it was his catching that would come back to bite him. He tried to catch a pass that was slightly behind him. He tried to turn and catch the ball, but it bounced off his hands. As fate would have it, bro, the ball bounced right to Ray Lewis, who took it to the house for a pick six and the win. The Ravens go on to win the Super Bowl. And for many, Eddie George's story had officially ended. And if you're viewing the story as Eddie being the protagonist, it's a heartbreaking way for the hero to go out. He was a dog, but history may not remember remember him well because while he got close he never made the play it's crazy how his career could be viewed so differently if not for literally these two plays if this ball gets over the goal line the titans win the super bowl and guess who's getting super bowl mvp in this game eddie was getting the best of ray lewis and even on this route he beat him pretty badly but he dropped the ball on the heels of people saying ray had him shook so the play framed eddie in a really bad light when the play happened it was six minutes left in the game the ravens was up by one touchdown 
The Titans was driving and had made it to a round midfield. And the last thing you can do is give up a defensive score. You got Trent Dilfer and them on the other side. I'd rather take my chances with them to get a defensive touchdown. Maybe without this, the Titans win the game. Maybe they don't. But if they do, this Super Bowl win never happens. But the talk going into the game and then this play happening and then Ray Lewis winning the Super Bowl, I feel like it took a massive bite out of Eddie George's legacy. And people of that era lost respect for him after that point. Like his mutilated Heisman Trophy, Eddie's body broke down and an injury stifled a man that almost no human could. Due to a displaced bone in the heel of his foot, got to a point where he couldn't run and cut the way he used to. But like I said, man, Eddie George had to hold some L's, but he wasn't crushed by the L. He didn't just lay down and die. Due to back squat the L, bro he put it on his shoulders and keep fighting bro with all that weight sitting on his back 2003 wild card round the titans and the ravens face off again eddie dislocates his shoulder making a tackle on a pick but you can never underestimate his warrior spirit it was just a wild card round but for eddie it was bigger something had been taken from him bro he wanted his lick back his mentality had changed bro he had nothing to lose so even though he was on offense he was hunting ray lewis and how bro he caught ray trying to tackle too high and he grabbed him with a steel form and power drove him into the ground the two lions popped up bro they growled and showed their teeth but the lion in the blue he won this round. Eddie regained something that had been snatched away by Ray Lewis. Basically, this era might have been done with Eddie George, but Eddie George wasn't done with them. With a busted up foot and a torn down shoulder, Eddie finished that game with 85 yards. More importantly, the Titans won the game and they sent the Ravens home to think about the L over a long offseason. Now, I would love to tell you that one more time, Eddie carried the Titans on his back straight to the Super Bowl. But the harsh truth is, bro, they lost in the next round. Eddie George never played for the Titans again. He played a year with the Cowboys, but retired shortly after once the reality that he was done truly set. In. when he left the game it was quiet it wasn't the way he imagined it the game just moved on and he faded into the background a man who spent most of his life performing in front of crowds and even spent his quiet moments imagining performing for a crowd now had to retire to a dwindling audience making him a warrior with no water fight depression set in along with that came ambient abuse or addiction not sure how he'd classify it but he sat up every night man couldn't go to sleep so he started taking more and more pills to try to get some rest he maintained the relationship with his father over the years and over that time he had many thoughts about his father's addiction the way it affected his life the way it affected his mother's life and the last thing he wanted to do was put his family in that position so he started filling his life up with brand new passions as opposed to brand new prescriptions acting on broadway running marathons went back to school to finish his bachelor's degree got his mba cameoed on survivor opened a restaurant and any other side mission you can think of his most recent quest has been as a college football coach he realized he beat the main story but the game's not over clearly a man with ambition and drive towards accomplishment an admirable trait by anybody's standards and while it can be dangerous if you have nowhere to point it that ambition can save your life once you learn how to wield it he pointed it in productive directions over and over until he finally found that spark and that zeal for life again you ain't gotta be a retired nfl player just to utilize this when you find yourself in a funk or in a slump this is the move Eddie George put together a phenomenal career, one that should be celebrated and remembered favorably. He's been named a Hall of Fame semifinalist twice at this point. And bro, just keep your feet moving till you finally break the plane. 